The Great Turkey Walk, Chapter 5 Jefferson City was the biggest place I'd ever seen. People back home had told me it couldn't hold a candle to St. Louis, but it looked good to me. Take that Capitol building. Made out of blocks of carved stone, it was. I couldn't help but stop cold before it and gape like the farm boy I used to be. Wasn't every day you got to see the capital of the capital city of the great state of Missouri. And churches. There was churches any which way you turned. I counted six or seven of them, every religion you could imagine. But general sightseeing wasn't why I'd truly come into Jefferson City. Why I truly left our camp just outside of the capital was on account of a broadsheet that had been hammered up to the sign pointing into town. It was the pictures that had caught my attention. But I stood and carefully worked out the words, too, one at a time. Biggest Little Circus of 1860 Jefferson City Tonight the picture showed a strange creature with this big old hump just lodging on its back, like it belonged there. Next to it was a lion, and to the other side, a tiger. I knew about lions and tigers from a picture book Miss Rogers had in the schoolroom for when she gave her annual talk on deepest, darkest Africa and exotic Asia. I'd heard that talk about eight times over the years. Never thought I'd see me real lions and tigers, though. But here they was, like a gift. Wasn't no way I could turn down that kind of a present. I ran from the broadsheet back to where Bidwell Peace was giving the mules a rub down. I got to go into Jefferson City tonight, Mr. Peace. His hand stopped its steady stroking motion. Thought we was just going to head in far enough in the morning to pick up the next road west, seeing as all roads in Missouri spiral into Jefferson City. Thought we was going to avoid confusing the birds with a real big town. I ain't taking the turkeys with me, Mr. Peace. I don't want them confused any more than you. But I need to go into Jefferson City. I truly do. He moved to another section of Brown Boy's flanks and began his rubbing again, a little more tentatively. I could go with you. Keep you out of trouble. What trouble? Only kind of trouble I could foresee was Mr. Peace getting near a saloon, of which a genuine river town and capital had to have lots. Even Uncle Lucas had said as how laws ain't never been made on sweet cider. Nevertheless, I think it would be a good idea for me to come with you, Simon. Come where? Jabeth had finally caught up with us from his day, trailing along behind in the woods. This time he had a string of squirrels slung over his shoulder. He offered them to Mr. Peace. Squirrels was mighty dumb today, just as stood there chattering in the trees whilst I let fly with my knife. Hope you knows how to make squirrel stew, Mr. Peace, sir. That distracted my drover for a moment. His eyes lit up. Brunswick stew, Jabeth. Simmered with some of that there hard corn we're caring for the birds. Tastiest thing you ever set your teeth into. Fine, I started sauntering off. You just save me a portion for when I get back. Back from where? Jabeth asked again. You going into Jefferson City, Simon, sir? Take me with you, please. I ain't never seen a capital city. Didn't like to do it, but I had to put my foot down. Think that's the smartest thing you could do, Jabeth Ballou, if you really and truly have a bounty out on you? He hung his head. I turned to Mr. Peace. I could tell saloons had won out over Brunswick stew in his mind again. Could see it in the set of his eyes. I stomped out that temptation fast. The two of you got to look after each other and the birds. Now I'm trusting you both. I won't be that long. Maybe a little past dark, you hear? The circus was set up on a field next to the river. 
It was just past a row of big stone and brick houses all squinched up into each other, with long porches running across their fronts on each floor, so a body could set out and admire that beautiful Missouri River. I admired it for a spell myself. There was one or two flatboats left over from the old days, but mostly it was steamboats pulled up next to the docks. I sure would have liked to see how those paddle wheels worked, but there was no smoke coming from any stacks, so I headed over to the circus tent. It must have been getting on toward time for the show because people was starting to line up for tickets. There was lots of youngsters jumping around, excited, and plenty of grown-ups looking near the same. I didn't buy me a ticket, though, because the only money I had was Miss Rogers, and that was meant for dire emergencies. So far, I'd only cut into it for that ferry boat toll. I thought maybe I'd find me a hole somewhere in that big tent and see what I could see. Except there were other things going on along the way to the tent. There was a stand where men were shooting at targets. I walked closer and puzzled out the sign atop it. It said for five cents you could take a chance and win a prize. There was a whole row of prizes just crowding a shelf, too. Over the crack of rifle shots, I studied them. Crockery. Wasn't nothing but little crockery gimcracks of puppies and kittens and such. I snorted. Didn't look like no nickels worth of a prize to me. Farther down the way, a little table was set out. Something very interesting was going on there. A fella in a fancy embroidered vest and garters on his shirt sleeves was given a pitch about how a sharp person could make his fortune mighty fast. Meanwhile, he was playing with these three funny-looking things. Seemed like furry brown balls that had been sawed in half. They was curious, so I barreled through the crowd of men to see better. Coconuts, the fellow was chanting. Coconuts can be faster than the eye, but they don't lie. He lifted one of them coconut things. It was all hollowed out, and sitting underneath was this shiny silver dollar, nice as you please. Then he clapped that shell back on and swirled the three around some more, lifted another one, and there sat that dollar again. Put your money down, gentlemen. It's easy as pie. Coconuts don't lie. A fat man next to me offered two bits. Them coconuts started in moving again. When they stopped, he pointed. The shell was lifted. Sure and certain there was that silver dollar. The fat man picked up his quarter and the dollar both and walked off looking mighty pleased with himself. See how easy it is, gentlemen, the fellow in the fancy vest said again. He pulled another shiny silver dollar from his vest pocket and slapped it down. Put your money on the table and make the first piece of your fortune. All this time, my fingers were in my pocket, hanging on to Miss Rogers' emergency money. If I was to take a chance on just two bits of it, why, I'd have a lot more back right quick. I figured for a minute before I could work out exactly how much more that'd be. It finally came to me four times as much. Plus, I get to keep the original quarter. That way, I could buy a quarter ticket to see the show and be educated by real lions and tigers. Also, there was that humpback thing I was developing a remarkable interest in. All around, it seemed like an investment even Miss Rogers would be proud of. I pulled out a quarter and plunked it down. The fellow in the vest grinned up at me. Here's a young man with foresight. A young man with big things ahead of him. That being the nicest thing anybody'd said to me in some time, I blushed a little. The gentleman raised all three of them coconuts so as I could see proper that two were empty underneath and one had the new silver dollar. Keep your eye on the coin. Then he moved them all around real fast. I stared hard as I could at the one with the money underneath of it, hard as I could. Finally, he stopped. I looked up a little dizzy. Call your choice, young man. 
I looked down again, knowing exactly which one of them coconut things was holding my new silver dollar. I pointed. He picked up the shell. I stared. It ain't there. My two bits wasn't either. It was already in his pocket. Got to keep sharp, young man. Give it another try. Well, I knew I could do it this time. I fetched out another quarter, got dizzy again, but this time I didn't lift my eyes. I kept them right on that coconut that held my rightful money. Then I pointed. It was empty again. I raised my head to those grinning eyes, like a fox as they was. Now, I ain't ever been known for having a temper, but all of a sudden, I saw red. I just lost me the self-same thing as two complete turkeys. Didn't help that them other men to the right and left of me was laughing up their sleeves, either. You galled me. I reached over that little table for the man in the fancy vest. His face turned shades of green and pink to match the vest stitching as my big hands grabbed a hold of his shoulders and shook him. You gulled me, and I won't be gulled. It's a game of chance, he started. He stopped as I shook harder. (laughs) Then he seemed to gather all his strength together to roar out one word. Samson! The strongest arms I ever felt were pulling me off the coconut man. I let go of the bundle in my hands to turn and grapple with them. The crowd parted in anticipation of a good old fight, and it would have been, too, if I hadn't have looked up, past a chest and shoulders every bit as broad and brawny as mine, into a face near a head taller than me, and clear through eyes as wide and green as my own. The fight went out of me. I was staring at my own image. Just like when I'd sneak a glance into Aunt May Bell's looking glass in the parlor back on the farm. Except there was a difference. I knew I was looking at me older. And he must have been looking at himself younger, too. Because the strength went out of his grip the same way. We just stood there, arms dangling by our sides. Just stood and stared at each other. What are you doing, Samson? The man in the vest was shouting. He edged nearer, cautiously. That lout nearly killed me. Samson shoved him away. Shut up, Claver. Ply your gambling tricks on someone else. Not. I couldn't be mistaken. On my only son. I gulped. It had taken me a while as per usual, to come to any conclusions. But how many Samsons could there be in Missouri? How many that was a spitting image of me? Paul? It came out in a squeak. I cleared my throat and tried again. You, my Paul? Samson Green? What's been gone these ten long years? Those huge arms came around and grabbed me up in a bear hug. Like to take all the stuffing that was left out of me, it did. Simon. Then he said it again. Simon. He dropped me and I worked my lungs like a bellows for a full minute. When I had all my air back, I stared up at him again. You're so glad to see me. How is it you didn't come looking back to the farm? How is it you ain't had no other interest in me since Mama went to her reward? End of chapter 5